The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. More than half a century ago, Canada dropped the Union Jack from its flag. Almost four decades back, the Constitution was repatriated, removing Britain's last bit of legislative influence. Is the next step to ditch the monarchy altogether? Tonight, in light of another former British colony deciding to do just that, we're taking up the debate. Then, historian and author Ben McIntyre joins Nam Kiwanuka on his new book about the Soviet agent who spent World War II undercover as a British housewife and who might just be the greatest female spy ever. It's Thursday, October 29th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Queen Elizabeth is the longest reigning British monarch in history, but there are some here in Canada who would like to see her days numbered as our head of state. And not just hers, but her heirs and any other vestiges of the monarchy as well. It's a topic that crops up now and then, but after another member of the Commonwealth, Barbados, recently decided to ditch the monarchy, it's come up again here. With us for the pros and cons of that idea, all of them in the provincial capital, let's welcome. From the Entertainment District downtown, lawyer Delia Opekoku, who among her many accomplishments was the first Indigenous woman to be called to the Ontario Bar. In West King West, Hans Bathija, Vice President of the British Canadian Chamber of Trade and Commerce. In Bloor West Village, Peter Danolo, formerly the Director of Communications for Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. In Corso Italia, Ashok Charles, Executive Director of the advocacy group Republic Now. And in East York, former Sun Media columnist Christina Blizzard, who covered several royal tours in her long career, and when she speaks, you will get a hint of an accent that suggests she just may be from across the pond. Uh, great to have all five of you with us tonight on TVO. Let's set up our discussion, if we can, by having our director, Sheldon Osmond, bring up this little fact file just to set the table for the discussion to come. Queen Elizabeth II is currently the head of state in 16 countries, including, of course, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and several other countries in the Caribbean and Pacific Ocean, such as Jamaica and Papua New Guinea. The last country to remove her as head of state was Mauritius in 1992. Up until now, 16 countries have dropped her as head of state since she was crowned, and Barbados will do so by November 2021. At age 94, the Queen has been on the throne, imagine this, for 12 Canadian prime ministers, 12 American presidents, and seven popes, and she has been Canada's head of state for nearly half of this country's existence. Okay, let's get to this. Christina, since you've got the accent, I guess we'll start with you. Uh, what does the monarchy, in your view, provide Canadians? Well, I think a constitutional monarchy with a, a parliamentary democracy is a very stable form of government. The crown, uh, as representing the state, as embodied by the queen, is a very, um, I believe, has provided this country um, with uh, a very stable, as I said, um, overarching uh, sense of government that has provided continuity. The Crown has a history of protecting minorities uh, in this country. And I think that as the Queen um, embodies the state, if you look at a republic, for example, the, um, the president is the personification of the state, of the government in a republic. And if the, if the president is dysfunctional, then the government is dysfunctional because it is so uh, per, uh, such a personal thing. Thing. And, you know, we only have to look to that great republic to our south to see that, uh, you know, when the president is dysfunctional, you do have um, problems arising where you can't even guarantee the peaceful transference of power, as we're now seeing during this election. OK, Peter Danolo, let me ask you the same question. What, in your view, does the monarchy provide to Canada? 
Well, listen, I think the monarchy is an anachronism. There was a case for it, certainly in our early years as a country, 150 years ago. But my basic problems with the monarchy are twofold. One is that it's a, I don't believe that high public office, any public office, but particularly the head of state, high public office, should be hereditary, should be passed from one generation to another within a single family. I think that's fundamentally undemocratic and at odds with a modern democracy. And secondly, to add insult to injury, uh, this is a British monarchy. It's a foreign institution. They're foreigners who are our heads of state. I think Queen Elizabeth is a is a figure of tremendous. She's a very impressive person. She's kept this institution going much longer than it should have. I think we should we should adopt a, a practice from the NHL and the other major leagues. And when she goes, we should retire her jersey. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a nice analogy. Let me uh, let me ask the follow-up question, which is your former boss, Jean Chrétien, had a lovely friendship relationship uh, with the Queen of England. Uh, how, how does he feel about your taking this position? He still does. He's a, he's only the sixth member, only the sixth Canadian ever to be on the uh, on the Order of Merit, which is the only order that the Queen personally chooses. He's only the third Canadian Prime Minister to be there. He's known her for about sixty years, or certainly fifty years. So uh, he's a monarchist. Uh, he and I disagree. Uh, he would also feel that this is. Um, uh, not a top of mind issue for most Canadians. And in that, he's right. But listen, that's always the case with issues like this. We're kind of like, uh, we don't want to deal with it because it's too much trouble. We're, we're like the millennial kid living in the parents' basement because it's easy. It's, it's, it's easier than moving out. Well, we were very slow in adopting a lot of the, the usual vestiges of independence. We Listen, we, it took us almost 100 years as a country before we adopted our own flag. So, But we slowly but surely, we've done these things. The monarchy is the last uh, item of unfinished business in this regard, and we should check it off the list. Delia, what's your view on what the monarchy provides to Canada? Uh, my view on what the uh, monarchy provides to Canada is with respect to Indigenous people in that uh, the original treaties were signed uh, with the uh, representatives of the uh, Crown uh, in, the, in earlier years in the right of Great Britain and later on in right of Canada and in Ontario in right of both Canada and, on, and Ontario. And for the reason, symbolically, it's very important uh, for many Indigenous people, especially the elders, to maintain that relationship with the Crown. However, uh, my perspective is that the duties that uh, uh, ensued from the treaties have been taken over by the uh, Crown and Right of Canada and, in, in, uh, and the Crown and Right of the different provinces. And so if there was a republic, uh, the duties uh, or the uh, informants required to ensure that the uh, treaties continue between uh, the original Great Britain pre-Confederation would continue in any case because the courts have ruled many times uh, that uh, the uh, duties are embedded in the Crown and Right of Canada and in the uh, uh, in the Crown and Right of uh, the provinces. And so uh, that would remain. But I certainly know how important the Crown is for Indigenous people. I'm wearing my uh, treaty medal because at a time when the uh, treaties were... Uh, were signed. Uh, this is what the commissioners who were representing the Crown would give to the Indian chiefs. And this is a commemoration medal of the Treaty Number no. 10, which is my treaty in uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And I remember when it was given out to us in 2017, it was given out by the Treaty Commissioner of, uh, of Saskatchewan, who represents both Canada and the province in the capacity of the, as the Crowns. Uh, it was a very respectful. Uh, uh, commemoration, and I recall especially the elders lining up to receive it and being so proud that they have the commemoration medals from the original treaty that was signed. Delia, just so let me jump in for a second. Can you hold that up higher, just sort of right by your face so that we can see it? No. There we go. Yeah. And now, yeah. now it, it seems to me you're, you're rather proud of having been a recipient of that medal, and I wonder whether you're... you're you, you know, is your position consistent with with the honor that goes with that medal? Um, maybe slightly not, but I certainly respect the elders, and I'm trying to carry forth their uh, their position. But my position is that uh, the uh, responsibilities and duties uh, signed under the treaties, irrespective, would carry on.
I understand. Okay. Ashok, let me put this to you. I, th I think everybody who comes to this country as an immigrant has to swear an allegiance to the Queen when they do so. And I guess you did. And then yes. 27 years later, I gather, you officially recanted that oath of allegiance. And you may have been the first Canadian ever to have done so. So tell mm -hmm. us why you did. So there were uh, two reasons, I would say. Uh, the first is that I simply do not have any allegiance or faithfulness to the members of that, the British royal family. I don't, and I wanted my government to know it. Secondly, I want to draw attention to how poorly this citizenship oath serves us. Um, I think we've got the whole thing backwards. We shouldn't be having Canadians swear fealty to the British royal family. We should be having our head of state um, pledge to uphold our charter of rights and serve the citizens of Canada. I think we've got that completely backwards. And, and secondly, I want to draw attention to the fact that this citizenship oath is our only opportunity to elicit a formal pledge from uh, new members of our society. And we squander that opportunity, insisting that they pledge fealty to the British royal family. We could be asking, as Australia now does, uh, Australia had an oath of citizenship similar to ours, and now they have a much, much better one, which uh, requires a formal commitment to democracy, to uh, egalitarianism, and so on. And that's what we should have. All right. Hans, you know the setup that's coming here. You're the guy who came to Ontario uh, back when Bill Davis was premier. You were telling me about how welcomed you felt uh, in the province of Ontario uh, when you first came here. What's your view on whether or not swearing that oath of allegiance to the royalty is important? Well, I mean, uh, you know, to, to be transparent, I mean, I came from the UK. I'm, I'm born in London, England, and came over here as a, with my family back in 75. My father is a refugee from the partition of India, so he moved from the Dominion of Pakistan to the Dominion of India, then ended up in London, England, met my, my mother, who's from Straight Settlements UK, which is now Malaysia. And uh, we came here in 75 because, you know, certainly Pierre Trudeau uh, issued a call uh, to come to Canada. So, you know, Trudeau and Davis working together to make Ontario a wonderful place to reside in um, was amazing. Uh, I became, my family became um, Canadian citizens in 1985. Uh, you know, by that time, certainly the last vestiges of British uh, citizenship in terms of rights and privileges in Ontario, in terms of voting and so forth, had come to an end. Um, we proudly became Canadian citizens, and certainly I've availed myself of all opportunities within this great country called Canada, um, you know, to, to play a part in the body politic and in civil society. So, but my take, given my father is from India, we certainly have a far more complicated relationship with the Crown than, say, Canada does. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm somewhat more neutral um, because of that. But that being said, and so from a business and trade perspective, the Crown does afford stability uh, in terms of trade and commerce. It does allow us connections to other Commonwealth realms, as well as the Commonwealth of Nations. So my take is it provides a stability that Canada needs in this war crazy world we live in. I mean, we look south of the border, what's going on with the Republic down there. We've got China. Uh, which is not democratic, nor a monarchy, nor a republic. Uh, it, is, it is its own, uh, well, it is a republic in, in a sense, uh, but they have their own system. So our system, I think, has worked well for all 11 crowns, as well as the federal territories. And Delia makes a good point. Their hereditary chieftains, they certainly feel very much a kinship towards the monarch. They do preserve the 70 or so treaties in terms of the older treaties. Uh, and the Canadian government has done, you know, uh, somewhat of a mediocre job, I'd say, managing those treaties. Uh, I'm not going to opine on that one. I don't have the, I think, capability nor the, the background to opine, but I would say mediocre uh, you know, ability to manage those treaties. We are getting better, no doubt. Um, but each province, cap the provincial capitals and, and the Ottawa, have a responsibility to manage those treaties on behalf of the Crown. And I think we are certainly progressing. I mean, Peter says, you know, we are evolving. That is true. And I will make a plug and say in 1988, when the Canadian Heraldic Authority was formed, that really was the last vestiges of the UK that we had, because now we can issue our own honors and awards. So we are a fully sovereign and functioning country. 
Uh, the provinces and federal government do work together in terms of our confederation, providing the stability for trade and for commerce and for citizens to evolve as they see fit. If Canada decides to go a republic route, it would need the majority of all the provinces okay, and well, the hold federal off on government that. to come hold, together. Hold off on that, Hans. We're yep. going to get to complicated constitutional amending formulas later in our discussion. I want to get Peter Donolo back in here because um, recollection is that back in the day when you were working for Jean Chrétien, you quote unquote accidentally put on some agenda the notion of getting rid of the monarchy. Uh, what happened there? Tell that story if you would. Oh yeah, listen. Uh, as you know, as uh, I worked with Chris and with you through the years, as uh, in terms of media relations, and I let slip once one of my preferences. I've been a I've been a Republican for you know, or an anti-monarchist. Let's put it that way, because I uh, republics are different matters. Since uh, you know, uh, I was a kid basically, and I let slip in a conversation with one of our most prominent journalists that hey, this would be a good idea to put in a throne speech, and of course. This ended up on the front page of the paper. Mr. Krejcian, being the uh, cool cucumber he is, didn't sweat it for uh, for a moment and laughed it off. I thought my neck was going to be on the line, but it wasn't. Uh, and then that was just a, one of the fun episodes I had uh, working for a guy who was just a lot of fun, the best boss I ever had, and still a great guy. But it doesn't change the fact that the monarchy, as I say, is an anachronism. I, I want to add one more one more problem with the monarchy, which is that not only foreign, not only hereditary, but our head of state has to be from one single religion, the Anglican Church. The, the British monarch is actually the head and protector of the Church of England. Again, so that in a country as, as diverse as Canada, that's a, another standing insult. So no, I think it's uh, it's time for the monarchy to go. How we do it is, of course, a, a fraught manner. And I want to point out just one other point since you've given me the mic, Steve, which is that, and I like Chris a lot, but I think she does what a lot of monarchists do, which is present a false dichotomy. If we get rid of the monarchy, then we have to have a US-style presidential system. That's not the case at all. Look at Israel, uh, Germany, Italy, they have heads of state who are chosen by their legislatures, not at all like the American system, and their head of state does not have the powers of a U.S. president. So I think that false dichotomy, I, I reject it, and I, I think it's it's uh, it's a rhetorical uh, um, uh, it's a rhetorical thing, but I, I really don't, I think it's a bit unfair. Okay, Christina, take them on. Well, okay, first of all, I think that to open up this can of worms would be very difficult, it would be very divisive, any time I covered royal tours, you understand the depth of feeling. Canada is the, you know, you know, it's the land of the empire loyalists. This is where people came after the War of Independence. And there are very strong feelings through great swaths of Ontario. You only have to see, uh, just watch, uh, you know, people come out, stand 10 deep waiting to see the queen or whatever war royal is there. And when you interview them, uh, it, people have this very deep feeling that, uh, the crown is one of the things that define us, defines us within the North American context. They understand that Canada, while we are a very large country, we're a very small population. And this is the one thing that sets, oh, one of the many things that sets us apart from the United States. And they want to maintain that very much so. And the crown has, as we've seen, has... Uh, um, you know, changed and evolved over the years, and it renews itself quite regularly. And I think, I think to open up this debate is something that we don't want to do, especially not. Um, I think it would be very difficult with First Nations. Um, you, any, any, uh, any time you're on a royal tour. Uh, at every stop, there will be a First Nations leader, a chief, and they will come out and they will bring with them a framed copy of their treaty. And they will, it, it's not it's not to say, oh, look what we found in our archives, isn't this interesting? What they are doing is they are taking it to which, whichever royal is there and they are saying, here, this is the treaty. It was signed by your grandfather, your great-grandfather, whichever, whoever, and they're holding that the royal, the, you know, the, the modern royal to account for that treaty. They're saying, this is our treaty. We want you to uphold this. Remember that your forebear signed this. So I think you would be, this would be opening up an unnecessary uh, can of worms that we really don't need to do because the crown has served us remarkably well. Delia, does she make a good point? Uh, for, for many of the elders, yes, she makes a very good point. But the reality was that the treaties were broken in spite of the crown. 
so often, especially in the times after 1812, uh, when uh, uh, our strength as partners and allies, we uh, started to weaken because of the takeover of the settler governments. Uh, but the representatives of the Crown uh, that were on hand in Canada did not uphold the treaties. And the only time that the treaties have been upheld is very recently with the... Uh, in fact, the only time that treaties were, uh, were taken to court because we had no... Uh, we didn't have the means to... Uh, to uh, challenge anything against the uh, treaties because our right to hire a lawyer was uh, uh, taken away from us uh, until very recently. I think it was uh, in the Indian Act until 1950 that uh, Indians could not challenge uh, uh, the, the treaties or land claims uh, and hire a lawyer. Uh, and that was the officials who represented the Crown doing that. She's symbolic, yes, or the, her her uh, ancestors are symbolic, and it's important for many Indigenous people that she carry on. But the reality is that the treaties did not start being protected, and then until people uh, who became educated were able to challenge in court, and that only started happening in the 1960s, 70s, and on. Okay, let me put that argument to Christina Blizzard, and and not only that, Christina, but you know there are critics today who say that the monarchy reminds them of colonialism. It is an out-of-date institution. In fact, some would allege that it's it's a racist institution as well. Could you speak to those criticisms? I think those criticisms are absolutely baseless. In fact, the Queen has demonstrated on numerous occasions that she is certainly not racist, racist and she opposes racism. If you look back to um, 1987, uh, there was a big movement within the Commonwealth to uh, a lot of the Commonwealth countries wanted South Africa dropped and they wanted sanctions. And obviously there was the issue of sanctions against South Africa because of that racist apartheid system there. And it's very well documented that that the Queen, behind the scenes, was supporting Brian Mulroney at the, uh, I think it was the Commonwealth Head of Governments meeting in uh, Vancouver at the time. And it was, uh, you know, she was pushing for uh, sanctions against her own Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, uh, did not want sanctions, and the Queen did. And she also wanted South Africa um you know, to remain part of the Commonwealth. If you look back to uh, when South Africa became a republic in 1960-61, the person who opposed that was Nelson Mandela. He wanted... Uh, uh, he supported the Queen. The Queen was gonna, lost all her uh, titles in South Africa, of course, when South Africa became a republic. And it was the white leaders in South Africa who wanted to become the republic. Nelson Mandela, uh, who ha became a lifelong friend of the Queen, when, when Mandela became president of South Africa, he invited the Queen back to South Africa for a state visit. And she, in turn, invited him back to the UK for a state visit. So I think that there's very flimsy uh, evidence. In fact, there's that very, um, that, you know, that very telling photograph of after South Africa did all this in the 1960-61, the Queen then made a point of dancing with the President Nkrumah of Ghana, uh, which, which was a photograph that shocked mm -hmm. uh, the South African leaders. The white South African leaders were angered and shocked that she was doing this. So I think to say that the queen is a colonialist or a racist, you're on very flimsy grounds indeed, because she has stood up to racists in uh, every turn. Well, let me bring another voice into this conversation, that of Philippe Lagasse, who is a monarchy scholar. And uh, we'll, we'll put this on the record and then consider whether those of you who would like to see this divorce happen uh, can make it happen, because it's complicated. Sheldon, here we go. When Canada patriated its constitution in 1982, monarchist premiers ensured that any change to Canada's status as a monarchy would require a unanimous constitutional amendment with the support of all provincial legislatures and the federal parliament. Specifically, paragraph 41A of the Constitution Act 1982 states that the unanimous amending procedure must be followed to alter matters related to, quote, the office of the Queen, the Governor General, and the Lieutenant Governor of a province. 
Peter, that sounds like an extremely high bar to jump over. Can you get over it? That's a problem. I mean, yeah, if it requires unanimous uh, unanimous consent constitutionally, very difficult to do, especially when most provincial governments and most Canadians don't consider it a priority. Uh, but listen, back in 1965, I just want to pick up on something Chris said as well. Back in 1964 and 65, uh, many Canadians would have reacted exactly the way she described the United Empire loyalists reacting to the uh, abolition of the monarchy. And they did react that way when Lester Pearson proposed a Canadian flag. They derisively called it the Pearson pennant. Uh, it was said, listen, this isn't a priority. We have thousands of other priorities in this Canada. And he pushed and pushed hard and wasn't deterred. And I thought, I think that's a kind of political leadership that it would take for something like this in the monarchy. You know, the queen is not going to last forever. You don't have to be an actuary to understand that. She's been impressive. I, I agree with everything that Chris has said about her. But the fact is, she's not going to last forever. We should be preparing for what comes after. We don't. Do we really want uh, King Charles? Do we really want a King William? Do we really want to be uh, represented and led by a family that's better in the pages of Hello Magazine than they are in our halls of power? Ashok, you have seen the constitutional difficulty in jumping over that bar. What's your view on whether or not we could actually do that? Okay, well, one thing is that um, amending formula section that you refer to, it doesn't only refer to the office of the Queen. It also refers to the number of members in the House of Commons that each province is assigned uh, the use of English and French as official languages, the composition of the Supreme Court. So to say that we can't change any of those things um, would be really pathetic, wouldn't it, to say that as, as a nation we can't evolve in those areas. So let's take that, um, let's make that point first. Secondly, I want to draw your attention to the, um, the insight of a, a very qualified constitutional lawyer, Ted McWinney, who argued that, um, that we could begin the process of phasing out the monarchy after the demise of Queen Elizabeth II quietly and without fanfare by simply failing legally to proclaim any successor to the Queen in relation to Canada. So I'm not saying this is a slam dunk, this is the way we can go, but Ted McWinney was a very highly qualified constitutional lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer alive and he can't champion this argument himself. But the argument is there and, and it's been made. And I think it certainly needs to be considered that we could sidestep the unanimity requirement. It is possible. It needs to be, that option needs to be um, studied. Hans, do you think it's doable? No, I don't, I don't think it's doable. I mean, we've certainly through Meech Lake, through Charlottetown, had, I would say, much more simpler attempts to uh, reform our confederation and uh, certainly with limited success, or in fact, maybe no success at all. Uh, certainly Quebec. I mean, I went to Glendon College, College Glendon, and uh, we bear the scars of a bilingual education, and I certainly wear my, my, my school tie. Um, I went through the referendum back in the uh, early 90s there. Um, you know, Quebec still has grievances around, you know, signing the Constitution. Uh, Quebec is still angling for more powers. I think is, is after the last 24 hours, they've been angling for more powers in terms of the leader of the Liberal Party of Quebec. So to get to the point of a republic, you would need almost all 11 crowns to agree to that. It may be a shorter route. I mean, being, being uh, of Indian heritage, I mean, India went to dominion status and then to republic status. Pakistan soon followed. They went Dominion, then went to Republic in 1956. So the question is for Canada is, is it a one-shop deal? Does it go to Republic right away? Very difficult to do. Australia, which has a very difficult amending formula, which was a, a double, double majority, majority in the states and majority at the federal level, uh, they couldn't do it. We have a far more complicated uh, formula in Canada in terms of also including the, our, our Indigenous peoples and our treaties. I mean, I visited all three Chapel Royals uh, here in Ontario, uh, you know, whether in First uh, Six Nations or uh, down at Massey, uh, St. Catherine's Chapel or Tyrannega, uh, you can feel the loyalty towards the crown that the elders have. Delia points out it's the elders and the hereditary chieftains. And certainly our federal government has acknowledged that they are willing to negotiate with the hereditary chieftains. So to replace all that is a long road traveled. And is it a long road traveled that we as Canadians, as taxpayers, want to take on 
at this point in our in our um, in our body politic? I don't think so. Given what's going on again to the south, we're about to head into a very rocky time with the Americans. With Brexit going on, with my my home country originally uh, going through its troubles with Europe and with the rise of China and other things, I think that monarchy provides a stability and oasis. And to get rid of it, to go to a Republican movement, is a really really tough tough road. I don't think Canadians have the appetite to do that. I mean, most Canadians are fairly dispassionate in politics in general, and this would certainly be a very passionate topic. But how passionate are people to replace all the symbolisms, all the traditions that this country has? And then the question will become, let's just say, for example, we do get to that point where people want to do this. What symbols do we replace it with? In South Africa, they actually have a presidential monarchy where you know the president of South Africa looks after hereditary chieftains till this day. So this carries on. So there are many formulas we would have to get to, to, to assess. I just don't see it happening, uh, Stephen. Well, let me see if I can uh, channel the, um, the compromising spirit of William Grenville Davis here and, and see if there's a sweet spot of compromise we can find here. On the one hand, there's the status quo, which is intolerable to some of you. On the other hand, uh, there is a... Um, you know, republic-style democracy, uh, as in the United States, which is a complete non-starter to many Canadians as well. Uh, I wonder if there's not a, a compromise in, and Peter, let me get Peter and Christina to talk about this first, and just briefly, we've only got a few minutes to go here, with, with maintaining our parliamentary, constitutional parliamentary democracy, but having, let's say, the Prime Minister and the Premiers choose a Canadian to be the head of state. Could you live with that, Peter? Of course, that's what should happen, whether it's a, a PM or the premiers or whether it's a name that the government puts forward to the vote in the House of Commons. It shouldn't be the way the current governor, the, the general governor generals currently chosen, because that tends to really just reflect the interest or whim of whoever happens to be prime minister. Uh, you know, other countries vote in parliament, maybe votes in provincial legislatures. Of course, that makes sense, Steve. The other thing is that, listen, the queen as a symbol or the monarchy as a symbol isn't what it was when uh, a couple of your guests first arrived in Canada. It's not what it was uh, uh, even 50 years ago. It's been diminishing every year, slowly, steadily, through my lifetime, used to be a time, and I, I'm too young to remember this, but in uh, in Ontario uh, movie theaters, people used to stand for God Save the Queen uh, before the movie started, uh, or at sporting events. Obviously, that's not the case. The Queen is not her, her picture's not even on all our currency. Let's continue down that path as well, of kind of eliminating the image of a monarch. As I say, no disrespect to Queen Elizabeth, but really, this is a family and an institution that belongs in the past, not the present, and certainly not the future. Christina, how about the compromise I just laid out? Well, I, I really disagree with Peter that people do not turn out for the royals. Now, clearly, he hasn't covered the royal tours that I have covered, because there you see hundreds of thousands of people show up every time the Queen visits uh, when uh, William and Kate came. It's it, This is not a dying institution in this country. And I think a great many people uh, are very happy with the way it is. I They're think celebrities, Chris. That's what they are. It's a, it's celebrity worship. Well, they turn out for Kim not, Kardashian, too. Yeah. No, that is that is where, uh, that's when people, royals want, run into trouble when they think they're the Kardashians. I think we've saw, we, we have seen that with perhaps the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. That's their problem. That is not what you have seen with uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who see it more as a life of service, and that is what it has been. I think what will happen going forward is that once the queen is no longer the queen, I think Prince Charles will actually be a very good king. I think what he will do is modernize the uh, the monarchy. I think he will slim down the core uh, family just to its essence and uh, will make some reforms in that respect. And I think it will, as it always has done, as the monarchy has done over the years, uh, will evolve and change to fit uh, to fit circumstances. But I think you really need to understand the depth of feeling for the monarchy. I was on one tour where the Queen drove from Stratford to Bramford and they had to short, they had to, um, I was wondering why they were so delayed. It was because in every town, every village, 
hundreds of people had showed up. They've not just showed up. They had showed up in their Sunday best. So the Queen had slowed down the cars so they could all get a glimpse of her. Well, I think I will use three words which I could use pretty much at the end of every program, and they are, we shall see. I want to thank the five of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. We really appreciate your time. Take care, everybody. Again, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. A great spy, of course, is one that doesn't get spotted. British historian Ben McIntyre's new book captures the untold story of one of the Soviet Union's most successful secret agents. She was, yes, she, one of history's most effective spies, hiding in plain sight as a housewife in the English countryside during World War II. The book is called Agent Sonia, Moscow's Most Daring Wartime Spy, and it brings Ben McIntyre back to her show from London, UK. Hi, Ben. Hello. Nice I, to see you again. I love this book. It's one of those books that you just don't want to put down because you want to know what's coming next. So tell us, who was Ursula Burton Ney Kuczynski? Ursula was German. She was Jewish. She was born um, just before the First World War and brought up in the Weimar Republic in that chaotic period in Germany between the wars when the fascists were on the march. And she became a dedicated communist, um, which she remained really for the rest of her life. So why communism? Why communism? Mm -hmm. Well, because from her perspective, the only people standing up to the Nazis were the communists. And that was a very respectable intellectual position to take. She became a revolutionary communist. And so she was very young when the Bolshevik Revolution took place and very old when the Berlin Wall came down. And so her story, in lots of ways, covers the whole of communism, from its sort of clear ideological beginnings to its chaotic ending. And so, in a way, her story is a way of looking at communism itself. But she she kind of fell into spying, really, by accident. Um, How? She was, she, well, she was recruited by an extraordinary woman in Shanghai in 1929 called Agnes Smedley, who was a very successful left-wing radical novelist, but herself a Soviet agent. She'd been recruited by Soviet military intelligence, Agnes. And they became friends, and Ursula told her of her of her political opinions. And Agnes then passed her on to a critical figure called Richard Sorge. Now, Sorge was the most important Soviet spy in China. He was running a huge network of agents, uh, because the, the Soviets at that point were bankrolling the Chinese communist underground. And he recruited Ursula as his informant. He then had a passionate love affair with her. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, she was already married at this point, And in fact, she'd already had one child, but the marriage was not really going very well. And really the twining of a romantic life uh, with this extraordinary spy who was described by Ian Fleming, no less, as being the most formidable spy in history. That's what really set her off on the espionage path. Well, she came from quite a prominent family. Can you tell us about the Kuczynski family? Well, the Kaczynskis were part of the kind of um, intellectual, academic, haute bourgeois Jewish world in Berlin. They were very well to do. They were very literary. Uh, in fact, her father owned the largest private library in Germany. So she was brought up surrounded by books in very comfortable circumstances, as you can see from this, this house where they lived. But they were, they were left leaning. They, the father wasn't communist, but he was certainly on the, on the left. And the combination of that and the kind of growing up in a world where the fascists were on the march, as I said, there was massive economic dislocation. Ursula was seeing, you know, the enormous gap between the rich and the poor. And in some ways, her decision to become a communist, a lifelong decision, was a sort of rebellion against her upbringing in some ways. But in what ways? The grip, sorry. In what ways was it a rebellion? Well, I think, I think you know, she did in part rebel against the kind of bourgeois circumstances in which she'd been brought up. Um, that said, you know, she wasn't, she, you know, she, she wasn't from the proletariat, but she definitely supported the proletariat. So she's one of those slightly complicated figures in all sorts of ways, Ursula. And she, but, and her communism changed through her life. It began in a very pure way, but it, it wasn't just ideology that drove her. She was also a risk taker. She loved adventure. She was, you know, she became, I think, rather addicted to the thrill of secrecy. Spying can be very, very addictive. And, and she, she, she got it in spades. It can be a drug, sort of, right? 
Yeah, I mean, and it's very hard to renounce once you start. Uh, and she had great grave doubts about communism. She wasn't a sort of simple ideologue. During the sort of terrible Stalinist purges of the 30s, during later events in communism, when it became clear that the project was not working out the way that she'd imagined it would, she had grave doubts, but she did stick with it right to the end of her life. Well, I have, um, you, since we're talking about uh, the purges, there are lingering questions about Ursula. The most profound is how she was so devoted to the Soviet Union in the time of Stalin's great purges. And you write in the book, Ursula later claimed to have been ignorant of the purges, the scale of the bloodletting, the flimsiness of the trumped up charges, and Stalin's personal agency in the criminal slaughter. She accepted the myth the capital spies were sowing an atmosphere of distrust inside the Soviet Union, making it no easy matter for those responsible to distinguish between the mistakes of honest comrades and enemy actions. In the jargon of mass slaughter, mistakes was a weasel word used to justify executions based on no real evidence. But Ursula knew that her friends and colleagues were being annihilated and that they were innocent. How could she claim to be ignorant when all of her friends and colleagues were disappearing? Well, the truth is that she wasn't in the Soviet Union for very long. That is one answer. She was taken there for training. She was really insulated from the rest of Soviet society. So she wasn't as if she was sort of living this every day. Um, she was able to say, and, and there is a truth in this, that she was not aware of the scale of it. People began to disappear and the whisperings were out there. But she never betrayed anyone. And she was herself never betrayed, which is very remarkable, actually, when you think that the the sort of currency at that time, the way to survive in Stalinist Russia was to betray your, your colleagues and your friends, and she never did that. But I don't want to defend her too much because I think she did what many people do, and it's a natural thing to do, she made her peace with horror. And it wasn't until much later in her life, in the 1950s, when the truth about Stalinism began to emerge, that she realized what had really happened. And that was a huge crisis for her. At the time, I think like many, many people involved in, in Soviet Russia at that time, she chose to look away. And it's one of the queasier aspects of her life. Mm. But what one has to remember about Ursula is that for the first half of her espionage career, she was spying against fascism. That was her target. She was trying to destroy Hitler and his, and his brown shirts. It's only when she comes to the Cold War and history pivots around her, mm. that she's then spying against the West. During the war, when the Soviet Union was allied with, with Britain and America and Canada, there was, she, was, she was, if you like, on the right side of history. She ends up on the wrong side of history, in my view, uh, during the Cold War, when she's suddenly spying against the West. I mean, you mentioned that she is a person who was spying and she wasn't betrayed. Someone in her in her circle almost um, got her, um, Olo, and there's this great line in the book that you have, the spy was being spied on. Um, you know, when we think of spies, we think, you know, it's a thankless job because people don't know what you are doing. But Ursula played a huge role in history. What were some of her accomplishments? Well, during, during the first part of the war, she was based in Switzerland. And there she was alone with her two children and this nurse, this nanny, Olo, who was her own childhood nurse. And at that point, she was running really the biggest anti-Nazi network inside, um, inside uh, Nazi Germany. She was running agents across the border from Spain, from Switzerland, and she was running her own radio transmitter. So she was ferrying all the secrets back to Moscow, and she played a pivotal role in that. And at one point, she even plotted the assassination of Adolf Hitler. Uh, one of her agents had spotted that Hitler dined every day that he was in Munich in a particular restaurant, the Osteria Bavaria. And Ursula worked out that if they planted a bomb next to the very thin partition dividing Hitler's semi-private dining room from the rest of the restaurant, they could kill him. And they were about to do this. They were weeks away from putting this plan into operation when the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact took place, which was the, the alliance. It wasn't really an alliance. It was a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And that day, she got a message from Moscow saying, cease all offensive operations against, against Germany. And that was, a, again, a shattering moment for her because she battled against Nazi Germany all her life. And suddenly, with this devil's alliance, 
the cause that she was supporting was in bed with the Nazis. And that was another great crisis for her. But, it, but she came very, very close to assassinating Hitler. In fact, of all the assassination plots against Hitler, that was probably the one that was most likely to succeed. So that's, in a way, the kind of first half of her wartime life. She then ends up in Britain. Um, where she's again on a mission from, from Moscow, living in the Oxford countryside with her three children and her husband, Len, um, and getting onto her bicycle and cycling in the countryside. In fact, in the back garden, in the privy, at the outside loo, she had built a very powerful radio transmitter with which she was ferrying the atomic secrets to Moscow. Ursula had a whole network of agents inside the British atomic, the top secret British atomic weapons programme. Notably, a man called Klaus Fuchs, who was a German, a fellow communist, who was essentially handing over to Ursula the blueprint of the atomic weapon. So when the Soviets detonated their bomb in 1949, that was largely thanks to Mrs. Burton of Great Rollwright, um, also known as Colonel Ursula Kaczynski of the Red Army. It's an it's an incredible story. What you were when you were talking, I read the book, uh, but I had like uh, shivers on my skin because had she not been where she had been, history might have been, history might have looked very different. Absolutely. I mean, you know, did, would the Soviets have built the atomic weapon in the end? Probably. Would they have done so, so quickly and so effectively and knowing that it worked without the help of, of Ursula and her agents? Really probably not. So she's one of the very few spies in history that actually makes a significant difference. And she always argued in later life that in many ways, she had made the world a safer place. Now, this is a this is an arguable point, uh, And it's long been debated by historians. But that very fragile balance of power between East and West, where both sides had the atomic bomb, she was partly responsible for that. And you can argue that that did make the world a safer place. It ensured that neither side would dare to use the bomb. Would one have wanted to live in a world where only one side, the Americans, had the nuclear bomb? I'm not sure we would. Well, she finally caught the attention of the British Secret Services. What happened? Well, they came hunting for her. And uh, it was really a woman inside the British intelligence service that really spotted Ursula uh, as being a, a danger, and, and they, they went to get her. But funny enough, I mean, the intelligence files are, are, are killingly funny on this subject because whenever they turned up, she would ensure that she was wearing an apron and cooking a cake. Yeah. Um, and they would turn away saying it can't possibly be Mrs. Burton because she has three children and a husband. She's, as they said, she's very busy with her domestic duties. So once again, she used her, her disguise as a woman very effectively. But in the end, they did realise it was her. And, and the way that happened was that Klaus Fuchs was arrested and she realised that they were going to, they were going to come hunting for her. And she vanished. She managed to escape from Britain really by the skin of her teeth mm -hmm. and ended up in East Germany where she spent the rest of her life. And she, um, she reinvented herself in East Germany. She became somebody completely different. She, and, she took the name Ruth Werner and she became a highly successful children's novelist. Mm -hmm. She became, she was even known as the Enid Blyton of East Germany. And she was far more famous as a writer than she would ever be as a spy. So as she had done throughout her life, she invented and then reinvented herself. And she, um, do you think that she was aware or, you know, because people kept underestimating her. Um, you have this great scene in the book when um, MI5 comes to her place and because she has an apron, I think she's baking a cake for her child. They dismiss her like, oh, she's just a housewife. She's known for making the best scones. Um, do you think that she was aware of that and she used it to her advantage? I think she was fully aware right from the beginning of her intelligence career that her her greatest defense, her best disguise, was to pose as a perfectly ordinary wife and mother. I mean, the downside of that was that her family believed that's exactly what she was. And for her children, the discovery, quite late in their lives, they were already in their 30s and 40s, the discovery that their mother had actually been someone completely different from the person that they knew that was pretty shattering, and I think it um, it really affected them for the rest of their lives. Secrets are dangerous things. They can be very toxic, and there is often a price to pay for these stories. And I think Ursula struggled throughout her life, really, trying to balance what she saw as the demands of her ideology as a spy 
and the responsibilities she had as a wife and a mother. And she never really reconciled the two. And even late in life, she said, I don't know if I've been a good spy, but a bad mother. And it troubled her greatly. How did you write about her without the urge to pass judgment? Because I think we tend to look at history in a rather black and white way, as if it was a sort of moral accountancy, that, that somehow, you know, there'll be goodies and baddies and the goodies will win and the baddies will lose and that somehow you'll end up with a moral answer through history. I don't think history really does that. I think what I tried to do with this book was to find some someone I found utterly fascinating and very complex and try to explain them within the context of their times, try to kind of get under the skin, if you like, of communism itself by looking at it through Ursula's eyes. And you have to suspend judgment, not completely, mm. but... But in order to do that, you have to try to inhabit the world that she was in. And uh, if it succeeded, that's what I hope this book will do, is that I'm not making an excuse for her. I'm not defending her. I'm certainly not defending Stalinism. Um, but I, what I'm trying to do, really, is to, is to look at the world from, the different, from a different end of the telescope, in a way, from the other end of the telescope. And one of the... Um, you, we mentioned how she kept getting dismissed because she was a woman. But in the book, you, you would say that she wasn't a feminist. Why was that important to point out? Well, feminism, modern feminism is, is a very specific thing. Ursula was not particularly interested in advancing the rights of women in the social contexts in which she lived. She was a woman with extraordinary talents who believed herself to be the equal of any man, I mean, and, and, and able to do anything that the men could do. And that makes her unique in intelligence world. I mean, there are lots of women spies in history from Matahari onwards and, and the great SOE agents of the war. Ursula is different in the sense that she was a trained intelligence officer. She was, she was a pro. She, this was for her a career decision to go into espionage. And she rose up through the ranks of the, of the Red Army to the, to the rank of colonel. I know of nobody in any intelligence service that did the same thing. It doesn't quite make her a feminist. She was not campaigning for other women to do the same. Mm. She was just doing what she knew she could do extremely well. You've written so much about spies. Um, did you ever consider about becoming a spy yourself? Or is that something that you don't talk about? <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I, briefly, I did. I was very, very briefly uh, approached by the British Intelligence Service. I met a long time ago, just after I left university. Um, and we, there was a, what, what, what I call it a brief dalliance uh, where I went and had a couple of interviews. Um, but it was pretty clear um, that I have the one thing disqualifies me really from being a spy, which is that I can't, as I've just demonstrated, I find it very hard to keep a secret. <laughs> so that kind of crossed you off the list. <laughs> I think they realised they were dealing with the wrong sort of person. As a writer and a journalist, your job is to expose secrets, really, not to keep them. Well, you know, with the way the world is today and so much of espionage happening online, how important are foot soldiers like Ursula now? They're still absolutely vital now. Human intelligence, as distinct from signals intelligence, which is the sort of online element of the modern day, Human intelligence is as important as it ever was. You need one with the other. You can't really do one without the other, and the two complement each other. So human spying of the sort that, that Ursula did, gathering information from people, is still as vital as it ever was. And the essence of spying really is, is what she did all her life, which is to look at other people in the eye and try to work out whether she could trust them. That's really what spying depends on. You know, throughout the book, um, reading about Ursula's life, there are so many points in her life where she was almost caught. It's stressful to read the book, to think of all the things that could happen to her and her children. Do you think she was, it was more about the cause or do you think that maybe for her, um, and I know we don't ask these questions about men, um, but do you think it was uh, the motherhood part of her wasn't as important? <laughs> No, I think they were equally important to her, but had they come to a, a conflict, I think, and she was very honest about this. I mean, she says, you know, I will stand by my children through everything unless the cause requires me to take up arms. So I think if it had come to a choice, and thank goodness it never really did, she would have, she would have stuck by her duty, as she saw it, as a soldier for communism. Now, today we find that extraordinary, the idea that anybody would, would put an idea, an ideology ahead of their family. But actually, it's what 
happens in, 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 in terrible historical circumstances. And, and if we look back at some of the heroes that we, that we celebrate from the war, for example, you know, the French resistance hero, heroes who were prepared to put their families in lethal risk in order to fight Nazi occupation, there is a sort of balance here. The truth is that from our perspective, Ursula was backing the wrong horse. She was, she was, she was supporting a repressive and appalling communist regime. But nonetheless, uh, it is one of, the, one of the tricky elements of Ursula is that throughout her life, as I say, she, she struggled to reconcile what she saw as her family duty with what she saw as her political duty. She does end up in East Germany, and uh, you mentioned that she became disillusioned later in life. Um, was she ever spied on by the, secu the secret police there? She was. She became a target of the Stasi. Um, it's an extraordinary thing, but when she turned up in, in East Germany, she, she announced or she told her Soviet spy handler that she didn't want to do it anymore, that she wanted to leave the club. Now, it's a very difficult club to leave Soviet military intelligence. Mm. It's a hard to leave thing alive, to right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to get into. It's even harder to get out of it. But she did. She walked away from it. And that made her suspect in the eyes of the Stasi. And they did, they kept an eye on her and they, were, they didn't entirely trust her to the point where, in fact, MI6, Britain's foreign intelligence service, launched a plan to see if they could recruit her back again. They never did. They, it, it never went anywhere. But there's some irony in the fact that, that a woman who had spent so long spying for the communist cause ended up uh, uh, being a target of communist spies herself. You know, Ursula's story reads like a Hollywood script. Has Hollywood come knocking yet? Well, it's funny you should mention that. Um, the, uh, I've, I have, in fact, just done a deal to, to, to turn Agent Sonia into, a, into an eight-part television series. I can't tell you who is doing it yet because we haven't quite inked it. But that, that's the plan, is to do it as a, as a long-running, slow-burn television series, which I'm really pleased about, actually, because I think if we try to do it as a film, it would be an adventure story and it would, you know, you've only got 90 minutes to make it work. With a slow burn, long running TV series, we can get deep into the kind of the spy craft and the complexity of her life that took her all over the world to Shanghai, to China, to Poland, to Switzerland, to Great Rollwright and then back to East Germany. So so I'm, I'm really excited about that. I think it'll, it, it'll be a tricky part because, of course, you know, whoever's going to do it, is, she's going to have to play every Ursula from the age of about 20 to the age of about 90. Um, which, which is going to be a challenge, I suspect. Well, Sandra, the producer of this, uh, and I have been talking about who we think should play, and it's Kate Blanchett. But Ben, congratulations. Yes. Uh, what a terrific book. Um, uh, I, I, I urge people to read it, to learn about history and this incredible woman in all her moxie and the mark that she left on history. Ben, thank you so much, and congratulations. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. That is the agenda for Thursday, October 29, 2020. This week, the new leader of the Federal Green Party, Annamie Paul, came a strong second in a by-election in Toronto. She'll join us tomorrow on that and what's ahead for her and the party. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO. For joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.